about FICOR. Now, before I get into deep, I want to first state the following. I have been a non-union, SAG eligible, SAG, and now I'm FICOR. FICOR is not scary, secret, taboo, as it is perpetrated to be. A little disclaimer though, the aforementioned may not be true if you live in LA, but for anywhere else, it's not an acting abyss that people say it is. If you're in Hollywood and you are FICOR, they say it is the kiss of death. I'm told in New York, not so much. The bottom line is that people are scared about FICOR and that many won't even talk about it. As I said, now I have declared a FICOR status with SAG, I can now work both union and non-union jobs. Now that I'm FICOR, I feel that I ran the gamut, some kind of uh, impossible death, defying obstacle course and somehow survived. That said, I am not advocating FICOR over SAG or vice versa. It's a personal decision. Now, I know that you're probably infuriated by me saying that because I was infuriated too. Whenever I would ask people if I should join sag after the SAG people would sing praise being a sag after actor, but clearly their perspective was biased. And all other people would say that it is a personal decision. And I was frustrated by that. But actually, they were right. But most people didn't say why they were right and it is a personal decision. But the difference between them and me is that I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why there are considerations. Again, SAG is not going to get you gigs. It costs money to go to auditions. Even when you're in town, parking, missed time from work, callbacks, gas to get you to the auditions, and even more if you travel across the nation state to state. Even if you're in town, parking, missed time from work, callbacks, gas to get to audition, and even more if you're traveling by air. Unless you're SAG, you have to pay for that flight, possibly rental cars, or train fare, Uber, Lyft, hotel accommodations, etc. It's a lot and it all adds up. Of course, if you're a SAG, the production is supposed to pay for all of that. But from the production perspective, unless they can really, really, unless they really want you and only you, they may elect to get someone else who is local so they don't have to pay for any of that. Number one, now if your daddy is rich or you have a sugar daddy or you have an inheritance from your grandmother or some kind of sponsor, then cost would not be a consideration for you. However, if cost is not a consideration, but you live in a small market and you want to get credits for your resume, then it's a personal decision that you have to make. Number two, now, if you don't have a sponsor, rich daddy, sugar daddy, or a wealthy grandmother, money will be a consideration for you because you have to pay your bills and you have to pay to get to auditions. But if you live in LA, New York, Atlanta, or Chicago, and are getting SAG work regularly, money may or may not be a consideration for you. There's plenty of SAG work in other places, but also plenty of competition. Golden rule number one says SAG members cannot work non-union jobs. In addition, you have to pay SAG after initiation fees and regularly pay SAG after dues. However, if you don't have money, the bottom line is, can you afford to join SAG? Not just the associated fees, but all of the circumstances around it. Number three. Do you have availability? Are you unemployed, self-employed, or retired? If no, will your supervisor let you leave on a dime's notice? Do you have vacation time, or do you have paid time off? Can you take off on a short notice? All of these things are considerations. So, just so you understand, with SAG, it depends a lot on your 
current socioeconomic standings as well as your availability. So in that way, it is very a very personal decision. Hotel accommodations, air transportation, land transportation, all of these things are considerations that hinge on your financial status. All of these things are considerations. So just so you understand with SAG, a lot depends on your current socioeconomic standings as well as your availability. So in that way, it is a very personal decision. Hotel accommodation, air transportation, land transportation, all of these things are considerations that hinge on your financial status. Again, I reiterate, it's a personal decision. For example, let's say you make $2,000 a month. Your rent, however, and other expenses add up to $1,500 a month. But you need a new car because yours is on the brink. You go to the dealership. There's a practical functional car for $150 a month which leaves you with $350 of disposable income. But wait, there's another beautiful car for $300 a month, leaving you with just $200 a month disposable income. If you ate Roman noodles every day, you can make it work. The bottom line is, SAG is not gonna get you any jobs. They're just not gonna do that. That is not their function. They will support you once you're on the set, but they're not gonna get you any jobs booked. And therein lies the problem. If you live in a big market like LA or New York, that is, that's not a problem. But if you live in a smaller market like I do, that has a large number of non-union jobs and virtually no SAG jobs, you will need to think about that. Is SAG going to pay your bills if you're not working? No. They are not going to do that either. By far, the foremost authority that I know on the SAG-AFTRA and FICOR is by far Ben Hawk. He is the unofficial aficionado on the subjects of SAG-AFTRA and FICOR. I highly recommend that you go to his website, actorsincome.com, and listen to his podcast with FICOR actors like Ricardo Lori and Eric S. Robertson. Ben also features a FICOR workbook on his site. One last thing before I close. As I mentioned, many people who have sag after status work non-union jobs, under the radar anyway. This is called working off the card. If you work off the card, it will be frowned upon by everyone. This is because FICOR actors resent you because they think, hey, that's not fair. I did the right thing. I declare FICOR status and SAG doesn't like it because you're violating the global rule number one. To both sides, you're lying and cheating, essentially breaking the law. FICOR is legal whether SAG regards you as a scab or, or not. It's legal. While FICOR doesn't necessarily carry a stigma everywhere you go, it can still ruffle, ruffle some people's feathers, but it really depends on your perspective. Here's a story that happened to someone I know. We'll call it FICOR Confrontation. It starts off with a short clip from one of my favorite teachers, Stuart Weil. Take a listen. <laughs> 